Hi everyone, welcome welcome to the second ELISA virtual brown bag, socially distant brown bag as I said last time. Um, I'll just give a brief intro. I'm Graham Spencer, data scientist um, at ELISA. Um, just a brief intro for anyone who wasn't able to make the first one. Um, so we all know the pandemic has made it pretty difficult to, to stay connected. So we, we thought we'd take this opportunity to um, have a series of live talks covering a range of data science and machine learning topics. Um, just intended to share knowledge, spark some ideas, um, stay connected and, and yeah, to start any conversations as well within your organizations and, and, and with us if, um, if appropriate. So yeah, everyone registered on the email list will get updates for, for all of the talks um, and please share forward um, yeah, and let us know any, any feedback as we, as we go along. Um, just, a couple of uh, just a couple of ground rules, just um, as we start, please stay on mute um, and also turn your video off if you can, just that helps prevent background noise, obviously, and also with the connection speed, if there's, um, we find on, on Google Hangouts, um, if there's a few few people on video, it can slow, slow other people, um, the connection down. If you have any questions, please submit them via the chat feature, um, just on the right-hand side, you can do it throughout the talk. Um, we'll probably just wait till the end to sort of run through any questions. Um, although based on last time, I think we'll try and make it a little bit more interactive. So if you are willing to ask the question yourself, I'll throw over to you to unmute and, and that way we can sort of clarify and um, yeah, have any follow up as well. If we, if we can try and make it a bit more, more a bit more personal. Um, yeah, just to also say today's session will be recorded. You can see it record at the top left there. Um, we're going to publish it on the YouTube channel, Eliza YouTube channel. Um, we'll also email around the slides and a link um, to the, the YouTube um, the YouTube video. Do check your spam filter. It is going to be a Mailchimp mail out. So um, yeah, just a um, heads up on that one. Um, just before we start off, um, just a, a bit of a call out. Yeah, if you're keen, if in it, if that's this topic or any other topics spark your imagination. You know, anything that you, you might want to look at in terms of your organisation, in terms of machine learning data science, yeah, just please reach out. Um, we can schedule a conversation with Patrick, with myself, with, with James, our, our CEO. Um, yeah, really keen to um, just engage on any level, really. Um, so without further ado, I'll just hand over to Patrick. Um, he's a data, another data scientist at ELISA. Um, and he's going to tell us about the various levels of automated machine learning. Hopefully he needs to unmute himself. All right. Can can you guys hear me now? Okay, sounds good. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Patrick. I'm a data scientist at Eliza. Uh, today's talk is on automating machine learning, and the goal of this talk is really to give you some ideas so that you can save time on machine learning projects. It's it's more of a conversation starter than anything. But there's a lot of tools and techniques for uh, automating machine learning that have have come out relatively recently, and I want to share them with you. So machine learning is in use by businesses today. It's not, uh, it's not a future thing anymore. It's a now thing. Uh, he, here's just a couple of examples. We have uh, dynamic pricing through Steam, uh, Amazon recommendations, uh, Siri, uh, of course, uses machine learning for voice recognition. This is an interesting one, Google Maps uses machine learning. It uh, applies machine learning algorithms to uh, satellite data. And that's how it's able to like draw 3D uh, images of buildings. Snapchat uh, uses machine learning to create filters. In particular, it uses this thing called a generative adversarial network. And of course, uh, machine learning powers chatbots, as you might see on Facebook Messenger. There's even more applications, uh, as particularly in robotics and uh, security. Uh, Windows Defender uses machine learning to detect viruses. Anyway, that's just a sort of brief intro to say why this topic is hot. Now, as far as the agenda goes, uh, we're going to cover three different kinds of automation of machine learning, uh, off-the-shelf AI, AutoML, and uh, developing custom algorithms. 
And these are kind of in order of most automated to least automated. And then we'll wrap up and do Q&A. So this is a high level overview. Machine learning, get, machine learning projects get more and more sophisticated depending on the kinds of machine learning involved. So the least sophisticated and kind of the most similar to normal software engineering is when we use off the shelf AI services. And here the focus is on accessibility. And there's, there's no real data required. There's no training of predictive models, et cetera. It's just you get a service and you use it. Next, we have AutoML. And this is where we use company data to train a, a model. Um, now, some of you may be doing AutoML uh, manually, but uh, yeah. Really, this kind of thing is where we have some sort of off the, sh uh, we have the algorithm that's already been implemented for us, but we need to train it on our data. So forecasting would be a great example of where we might apply this, because kind of by definition, you need to have proprietary data about the past to forecast the future. And finally, we have uh, custom algorithms. I, I, I consider these the cool projects. And this is where we might, uh, it doesn't have to be completely new, but we'll stitch, we might like stitch two or three different machine learning algorithms together in order to make some sort of new algorithm. And I think a great application of these is uh, making new products or services, uh, things like Snapchat filters or Siri. And, and these can create a real competitive advantage. So let's start with off the shelf AI. And I think if you can, especially if you're doing a proof of concept project, uh, off-the-shelf AI is where you want to start. And there's a few different use cases of off-the-shelf AI, um, things like conversational interfaces, enterprise search, and audio transcription. And the nice thing, and I think the business application for a lot of this stuff is making uh, new interfaces to existing products or services. So you make a chatbot which uh, exposes, uh, which gives access to your Q and A page. So let's uh, let's run through some of these uh, conversational interfaces. So this is things like chatbots and Alexa skills. And the way this works is that you want to make an intent-based flowchart. An intent is like a way of saying something. So like, I want to buy this product. There's, there's, there's different ways of saying that, like, do you have this product available? And you can, and the way these services work is that you give two or three sample utterances per intent and you make an intent based flowchart. And there's a kind of obvious use for these chatbots, which is to uh, integrate with services like Facebook Messenger and Slack. Enterprise search is an interesting one. This is where you want to search across all your different company data. And the idea is that maybe your knowledge base is, is scattered around, like you have various wikis and documents and internal websites and so on. Uh, and if this is the case, then, then enterprise search tools can be really useful for being able to consolidate that knowledge and search across everything. We also have audio transcription. Uh, this is a technology that's gotten a lot better uh, through time. And a, a couple of use cases here might be monitoring call centers and, and, and radios for sentiment. Uh, OCR, optical character recognition. This is where we want to uh, take an image of a of a writing and work out what the writing is. Uh, so digitizing forms or reading license plates might be sample use cases for OCR. And finally, facial recognition. Uh, this is an interesting one because I think there are some uh, perfectly fine business case use cases like uh, authentication. 
or um, Snapchat filters or the like. But uh, also, uh, this can be politically controversial because uh, facial recognition technology is often used in surveillance. And it goes without saying that all, all these uh, services, all these use cases have cloud services and open source projects that you can use to, to implement them. Now, just a sort of couple of caveats on, on this off-the-shelf stuff. The biggest one is that machine learning is probabilistic. It's, it's almost never 100% accurate. And furthermore, the training data that machine learning services use may not reflect your situation. It, it's probably generic. There's, there's a risk of sampling bias. Uh, so it's hard to trust vendor accuracy figures. So what you want to do is uh, have a tech assessment. And this is a quality assurance process where you want to verify that the service is going to be accurate enough for your use case. You, you might prototype a solution with, with an off-the-shelf service. And before you release it into the wider world, uh, you need to you need to do a field test. Furthermore, it's it's always a good idea to engineer for failure. You want to uh, create a, an exception workflow for handling mistakes from machine learning gracefully. Now, off the shelf is really easy to use, but there's a couple of downsides. Uh, one is cost. Uh, vendors will. A lot of these cloud services might cost a lot of money, or the vendors will charge a substantial markup on computing costs. I think uh, I think the Cloud Vision, for example, is about uh, five cents per thousand predictions, and it can be if you use these a lot, it might be cheaper to re-implement them uh, with your own hardware. Furthermore, it's generic. The, the services are generic. They're, they're not going to be designed for any specific problem, so they can't uh, take advantage of information that's specific to the problem. Uh, and finally, there may be an issue of data sovereignty, especially for cloud services, uh, scanning personally identifiable information. Um, most of these services uh, aren't hosted in Australia. So if you want to use sensitive information, then you then you may need to explore alternatives. Anyway, data sovereignty is a risk. So that, that's uh, what I have to say about off-the-shelf AI services. Graeme, are there any questions before we move on to AutoML? No, I think we'll uh, go straight through. And I've got a few, but we can wait till the end, I think. All right, sure. So the next uh, the next idea is this idea of auto ML, and this these are just some use cases for uh, writing your own machine learning algorithm. Things like forecasting, fraud detection, product classification, data entry, damage detection. The thing that all these use cases have in common is that they usually need to be trained on specific company data. So for example, uh, your product, if you, do, if you want a product classifier, you kind of need to know what, what, SK, what SKUs, what stock keeping units your company has. So you need to know what products you sell before you can classify them. Uh, ditto with uh, forecasting. So, this is the machine learning process. We gather training data, we select a model algorithm, and we configure it. We then train the model and evaluate it. We then ask, well, is the model good enough? And if it's not good enough, we try a different. We select a different modeling algorithm, or maybe we adjust the configuration a little bit. Sometimes we might gather more training data. And typically, data scientists will kind of spin around this loop for a while before they finally reach a model that is good enough that, that can be deployed. And uh, often, 
if you don't use auto ML, then you're still going to use this approach. You'll just uh, create one uh, Jupyter notebook per algorithm. Now, one thing you can do if you take if you follow this process is that you can create a leaderboard. This is what uh, Kaggle.com does, for example. And here's a sample leaderboard. The, these figures are all made up for for illustration. And we might have our our model, uh, the accuracy achieved, uh, the F1 score, which is just a different metric uh, for classification. Uh, the time it took to train the model and the time it took takes to generate a prediction. And finally, the uh, model, the size of the model weights in, in megabytes. And uh, if we have this leaderboard, then you can start to see how you might automate that process I described earlier. What you do is you just Find you pick some model configuration and algorithm, you train the model on your training data, and then you add add that model and its metrics to a leaderboard. You do this enough times, and then you choose the best model from the table. And the great thing about this is that this is a loop that can run that can be entirely automated. No, no data scientist is necessary. Uh, what isn't automated is defining the problem. Sometimes it's ambiguous about whether you're solving a classification or a, or a regression problem. Uh, getting your training data and, and wrangling it into a form that's compatible with machine learning uh, isn't automated. Uh, labeling the data isn't automated. This is especially a big deal for uh, image classification. Uh, data labeling can be uh, time consuming. Uh, choosing the right metrics isn't necessarily automated either. This is, uh, this is really important for fraud, for example, where the risk of uh, failing to identify a fraudulent transaction may be much greater in terms of damage than, than uh, falsely identifying a legitimate transaction as fraudulent. And finally, the integration of a machine learning system within, a, within software is not going to be automated either. But the actual work of finding your model can be automated. And there's various uh, tools and services that can do this. Um, AutoML uh, by H2O is an example. Also, cloud services, Amazon, Google, Azure, and IBM all, all provide AutoML type services. Um, furthermore, uh, if you want to go open source, uh, the scikit-learn model selection library is great for this. Uh, I, I use the random, I've used the random search to 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 find the best uh, classifier for a project. And yeah, I. If there's one thing you take away from this talk, uh, use AutoML when you can for doing model selection. And because model selection is uh, really is kind of taken care of for us, but here's a few best practices I'd recommend when you're doing uh, a project where the need for AutoML might come up. One best practice is to use machine learning pipelines, uh, as Sh and Shin has talked about these a lot in a previous presentation. And, and the reasoning here is that you want to be able to reproduce what you've done. So a machine learning pipeline will, autom will automate all the steps from uh, wrangling your training data to training your model to uh, saving it and deploying it in its final state. Next, you want to find the appropriate metrics. This is where data scientists can really add value. And, and the reason is uh, suitability for your business. And I want to tell an anecdote here about the Netflix, cha Netflix challenge. Uh, Netflix offered a million dollar prize to uh, participants who could come up with the best recommendation algorithm. But the, the eventual winner 
of that prize, the system that they designed was never actually used by Netflix. And the reason was that even though it did great in terms of accuracy, it was too complex uh, to be actually usable. So uh, you, you need to take into account not only accuracy metrics, but things like model complexity and speed and so on. Yeah. Uh, typically, I find that if your model isn't accurate enough, uh, model selection is one way, but usually a more effective way is to find new information to add to your machine learning model. So for example, if you're doing forecasting, uh, you can spend a lot of time developing a new forecasting algorithm, but you may want to find uh, additional data like weather or, or um, customer, customer attributes, which uh, can improve that forecasting model. And finally, I would recommend uh, that you have strong operational support. And the reason is machine learning projects are really operationally complex because not only do you have your code, but you also have your model weights. And it's often difficult to, to store and version these model weights because they're so big. Furthermore, uh, the kind of people that you hire as data scientists often come from academia and will have less uh, DevOps experience and cloud experience because they're so focused on the mathematics. So uh, if you're doing auto, if you're doing NL, if you're doing your own machine learning project, uh, it's probably worth assigning a, a platform engineer or a DevOps specialist to the project. How are we going, Graham? Still, uh, lots of still lots of questions in the chat. Um, yeah, just carry on, and then I think we'll do a, <clears throat> a big call out. Plenty of time to to go through them at the end. Awesome. All right. So, custom ML algorithms. So, there's a few use cases of this. Custom ML is when you want to. Uh, None of the existing algorithms actually quite meet the needs of your problem. So you need to make your own algorithm that makes use of machine learning. Now, this sounds really complicated, but often it can be just a matter of like stitching uh, two or three different algorithms together, or like first you apply one algorithm, then you apply another. Um, you might come up with your own neural network architecture that is very heavily based on an existing one. And there's a few different use cases of this. Uh, two that particularly stand out to me are uh, dynamic pricing. Uh, this is where you use machine learning to actually set prices. Uh, this is applied. This works quite well for uh, the cases where you're allowed to, where people don't mind you adjusting prices on the fly. And uh, augmented realities. So this is where you uh, take in information and, and then you from from the real world and then you modify it. Snapchat filters are an example. And you don't want to you don't want to go custom unless you have to. But there's a few there's a few indicators that you want to go custom. One is that your input data might be unusual. Uh, for example, you may need to work with a graph, with a graph data, network data. Or you might have a combination of data. You might want to integrate both uh, images and text, for example. Uh, another reason that you might want to go custom is that there's just simply no cloud services available for, for this problem. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And this is something that can change. Like what, what today may be a custom project might, might be something that you use an off-the-shelf service for three years from now. Another reason you might want to go custom is that the uh, 
output data requirements might be unusual. And what I mean by this is that often machine learning has a fairly straightforward uh, interface. Often uh, you're just producing a number. But you may want to do something more interesting, like generating images. I'm, I'm sure there's been a lot of papers around this of generating new faces and so on. And in that case, you want to, if your output data is unusual, if you want to do something dynamic or personalized, or, then uh, again, you need to use an algorithm which can do that. And that often means going custom. And uh, finally, uh, your algorithm may need to do planning in an environment that, that changes. And I think a great example of this is uh, trading, where uh, you, you may need, you almost certainly want to include some sort of stop loss mechanic if you make a trading bot. So I don't have much to say on the technical end of uh, custom algorithms, but I do want to call out a few different ways of working that I find uh, particularly useful when you're doing this sort of work. First of all, you want to have uh, good equipment. And in particular, your data scientists need to use GPUs in order to train, uh, to audit in order to experiment with models. The, uh, the time saving, it takes about 10 times less uh, time for a model to be trained on a GPU versus a CPU. Uh, so if you use MacBooks, uh, <laughs> MacBooks don't have a great GPU to, for model training, so they may, you may need to either connect to some sort of workstation in the cloud or get a new laptop. Second of all, you need a dedicated collaboration space. In my experience, research and development does a lot better and is almost driven by the number of conversations that you can have with people. And this includes things like whiteboards. If people are in, a, a, if people are hot desking, and there's kind of an, an accepted office policy that you're not meant to talk too loud or too near people, then then this can really undermine collaboration space. So uh, have some sort, just be mindful of that, and ideally have some sort of room where everyone can collaborate. A phase of development that may not may be new is this idea of a literature review. So this is where people spend days just Googling other possible solutions that might, other possible solutions to this problem. And this can be incredibly useful. This is a kind of necessary part of any, any kind of uh, custom work. Like it, it, there's no point in trying to come up with a solution yourself when someone's already come up with it and has written about it. Another bit of advice I'd give is to work with designers. And the reason is that often you can, uh, if you just tweak the problem or the user interface that you're designing for, uh, then, then things can uh, be a lot easier. You want to be able to negotiate the scope of the project to, to fit what is technically feasible. And finally, I would ditch the daily stand-up. Um, this might be controversial, but I find that for these kinds of projects, you, you a day just really isn't long enough to show to guarantee any kind of progress. But a week in a week, you you usually will have uh, enough progress for a status update. And of course, you want to have a lot of ad hoc meetings to to do technical collaboration. And finally, I just say that I. I personally find these projects incredibly fun, like, and everyone I've worked with on, on projects like these is really enjoyed them. So uh, this might be a way to help with employee retention, you know, stick with it and you get to do a custom 
ML project. So to summarize, we have off-the-shelf AI. And a, a great use case for this is new interfaces. And a couple of the a real risk for this is data sovereignty. And you want to be able to do a tech assessment. When you have auto ML, this is where we need, we're basing our project off of company data and custom algorithms. And this is where we need substantial expertise. Uh, but these things can really create a competitive advantage. All right, any questions? I think there's a whole bunch, right? So, yeah, thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, so everyone, please put questions in the, in the chat. Um, even just a quick overview, and I'll, I can throw to you um, to ask the question yourself and, and, and get clarity. While we're just waiting for um, anyone to do that, I you know, implore everyone, if they have got one, to, to do that. We've got plenty of time. Um, I've got a couple, which maybe we can kick off. Um, Patrick, you, you sort of talked really well about yeah, even in an auto ML project where the, the role of the data scientist is in terms of almost like before and after the, um, the auto ML box. I wonder in an off the shelf project on off the shelf um, task, what's the role there? How do you see the role there of a, of a data scientist in a, um, in a project that uses an off the shelf AI solution? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so probably what I would say is that I think they can be really helpful in the tech assessment phase. Uh, you know, just verifying, hey, is this solution actually good enough for our needs? Um, I think also a data scientist can be helpful um, in identifying uh, what kind of service we might want to use. And this is really in the kind of problem framing stage of, all right, well, uh, we want to make a chatbot. Well, really, we want to use a conversational interface type service like Dialogflow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's what I would uh, say for uh, how a data scientist can be useful for off-the-shelf AI projects. But I mean, honestly, I, I don't think uh, you would want. I don't think you need as many as much data science work when you use off-the-shelf AI. That's kind of one of the advantages. Yeah, just yeah, obviously, yeah, more to data science than just. Than the model building and yeah, framing the problem is is very important in that one. That's a good um, a good way of putting it. Um, I mean, uh, it's a question just come through from um, Sophia. So they said, do you have a view on how you could develop digital maturity within an organization uh, to move between these ML types? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. I think probably to start with, uh, using some sort of off-the-shelf AI, using a pro doing a project where you're likely to use an off-the-shelf AI solution is probably a good start. And this this is about getting programmers just enough outside their comfort zone that they can um, that they can. Uh, uh, use AI services. So uh, probably a great start would be uh, making a chatbot because it's something that has been done enough times that there's good guides on it, but also this notion of uh, it'll also just bring up things like exception handling and, you know, working with uh, services that may not be 100% accurate. And how do you design for that? Then later on, when, when the programmers are more comfortable with that, then the next phase could be uh, taking off the shelf AI solution and uh, uh, product and uh, moving uh, the AI component in house. Uh, so another example might be uh, 
let's say, let's say you let's say you do a project that involves uh, transcription. Now there are lots of uh, cloud transcription services, but there's also open source services that you may want to use. So then you can start to uh, get away from get away from the vendor markup and, and, and into something that you host yourself. And uh, programmers will have to get more familiar with like managing model weights and so on that these uh, services might typically employ. Uh, then later on, you might want to, uh, when your company is sort of saying, all right, well, hey, we've used machine learning before, we can do it again. Then you might uh, want to move on to something that's auto ML related, and probably a nice, probably a really nice project for this would be fraud. Uh, sorry, forecasting, because it's it's really easy to tell whether or not you got it right. And uh, yeah, again, you can kind of uh, use relatively off the shelf. You can use relatively simple and easy to use services to, to do, to train a forecasting model. And it's fairly straightforward to verify whether or not those services, whether, whether or not that model is accurate. And then you might develop more and more sort of in-house machine learning solutions. And finally, uh, move on to the custom stuff. Now, does that uh, kind of provide a roadmap for maturity. Awesome. Yeah, any other questions? Um, yeah, feel free to um, put them in there. I mean, I was just interested, Patrick's going in terms of the, the custom algorithm, yeah, the, the one you've got at the bottom here. I wonder if, if you could maybe talk through one or two that, you know, in for, sort of um, typical examples, just, uh, you know, when I sort of hear custom algorithm, I have a vision of coding back propagation by hand or something, whereas it uh, might just be that, that, you know, the business use case doesn't quite fit into, um, you know, a template or something like that. I just wonder if, if there are any that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That don't blow out to something horrendous. Yeah, for sure. So uh, two examples that spring to mind are, uh, one, we did for an energy, uh, one prototype we did for an energy company uh, where uh, we wanted to read electricity meters. And uh, these meters had a sort of special kind of display that was based on uh, clocks. And so we needed to first uh, identify where the clocks were and then read what the clocks have to say. And so that was uh, chaining two different machine learning models together, one for object detection and one for classification. Um, another example would be uh, some work we did for a bank to do with uh, transaction forecasting. And we had uh, an NLP piece there to identify the kind of category of transaction and then a uh, classification algorithm to identify whether or not that transaction would recur. And then recurring transactions would be sort of, we could, gener we could then generate a new uh, transaction history based on, hey, here's all the recurring transactions that are coming up over the next three months. Yeah, OK, so one to sort of have multiple components or multiple targets of along the way as well as um yeah that can cause that that custom the need for that custom build okay that's, that's yeah exactly cool. um yeah i mean i'm interested maybe sort of going back a little bit in terms of the the off the shelf you, you did highlight a couple of examples where there are open source as well as the proprietary cloud services um that you know can get quite pricey possibly I just wondered, like, you know, how, you know, what's your view in terms of the, the balance between some of these open source ones and you know, a, a lock in and the sort of the accessibility, say, in an organization, if you have access to AWS or, or access to GCP? Um, 
and also from a data science point of view, we, you know, we normally used to downloading a package from Python, downloading a package from R, playing around with it, you know, understandably, it's a bit more closed with the, the proprietary services, but yeah, how that, how that impacts businesses looking to implement these type of solutions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, the biggest, I think one thing that these cloud services do that's really useful is that often they're quite good at the deployment end. Like they'll give you uh, an API and that API comes with an SLA and, and uh, programmers can call it using JavaScript or whatever. And so that, that end is really nice versus something like if you're doing something open source, then sure, you'll have the algorithm ready to go, but you may need to create a, an app that uh, exposes that exposes this algorithm. And that can be confusing if you're a data scientist and you've never done it before. Whereas with, uh, I don't know, something like, whereas say, speech and text, with a speech to text service, you just uh, say, hey, uh, just query this URL. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, a thing is as well, if you, you know, move organizations or you move from one cloud service to another, then um, yeah, obviously that you've got difficulties there, but yeah, I, I, I take that point in terms of these often nice packaged um, entities that you can, you can call on. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, last call out for questions. I'm just going to carry on. I've got one more for my grilling, Patrick. Um, but I just wondered if it would be good to talk through just you know, high high level, just a sort of typical process for, for not in an auto ML one. Is it, it's like, you know, do you sort of have a, a series of families in terms of algorithms that you would look at and then deep dive and tune within one or, or set it up to almost, you know, do that blanket search? Um, you know, across all of them and, and you know, to try and really find the, the global minimum. Yeah. And I think with AutoML, there's kind of uh, two different types of AutoML. Uh, one is where you use an AutoML service and one is where you use what I, what's known as hyperparameter tuning. So if you use an AutoML service, you have less control this is stuff like uh, Cloud Auto ML or SageMaker Autopilot. Yeah, that's very much plug and play, and you and and you can't really control what what uh, what models are getting searched over. On the other hand, you can do uh, hyperparameter tuning through things like sklearn model selection. I think Spark has something similar as well. I, I forget the name of it though. And there, you you get the control, but you also have the downside that you have to configure it. So, uh, what I might do is uh, I might like try one or two algorithms just by hand, just to make sure that I've correctly framed the problem, and then. Uh, if I'm doing a hyperparameter tuning, I'll, I'll just sort of add ev add everything in the kitchen sink and wait a while. Uh, yeah, I, I don't Which think it then comes to the idea of doing it on a on a platform with GPUs and um, take advantage of the the speed from that. Yeah. I think one thing that I didn't mention, which is probably good to mention, is the idea that uh, a lot of this process can be done in parallel. You can have like one you can have like one GPU per algorithm configuration. So uh, th this doesn't have to take particularly long either, which is, yeah. uh, which, is a, which can be a nice feature. Cool, okay, well, yeah, thanks again, Patrick. Yeah, really, really interesting talk. And yeah, I really like, like how you framed it um, across the, the three different types and, um, yeah, and I so hopefully we all spotted there an, uh, an extra reason why we shouldn't uh, have hot desking beyond the the hygiene considerations of a um, of a pandemic.
<laughs> so just to finish up, um, as I said at the beginning, we'll email out the slides um, and a link to the recording. As I said, it might be in your spam filter, so please just um, check that. We'll probably send it out tomorrow. Um, next brown bag will be two weeks time. Same slot seems to work pretty well, and, and everyone will receive an invite for that. Um, yeah, if um, yeah, if, if you want to reach out, anything interested, has, anything from this has sort of sparked your interest, there's our email there. Um, there'll be a way to book you know, any time with us and, and, and reach out in the follow-up email. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Patrick. Thanks everyone um, for joining and have a good rest of the afternoon and week. Thank you.